That's very kind, and, and uh, it's a real honour to be here. A lot more interesting giving this than talking to first years about linear algebra, because you've all been through that. So we'll get straight into the algebra. And um, <laughs> I tend to pick people on colours. Um, purple, you're in, in a lot of trouble there with that purple shirt. I always pick people with purple. But no, I'll be nice. Um, now, I need from you to ask questions, OK? This is not a lecture, this is a talk, and talks are two-way things. So if I say something, you're easy there, I don't know what's going on there, ask. Ask. You know, I've got all evening. Um, uh, it's very hot at the back. If you pass out, please do it noisily. Um, uh, I'm sorry about the heat. Um, uh, it's always hot, so heat goes up. I failed thermo, but I do know that. OK. Um, I really did. <laughs> like, like, spectacularly. I don't think my thermo tutor's here, but sorry. So um, this is the real title of the talk. Uh, and yes, how many of you saw the, uh, the robot car across the road? That's just great, isn't it? Oh, that's great. Well, the, I've got the best job in the world, OK? Because I get to do research, and I get to work with really, really clever, enthusiastic people. And we have an opportunity to make a difference. And I'm going to start this talk about why we can make a difference as engineers. We all know as engineers that's what we want to do. And I think it's interesting to think that universities can still do that, not just in teaching, but engaging in problems that have deep societal impact. Now, I could have given this talk about warehousing or uh, surveying, but I'm going to theme it around the robot car because everyone gets excited about self-driving cars. But it's a small part of what we're doing, and you, I'll try and make some points that show the wider impact of what we're doing. For example, we just uh, licensed something for Mars, and some of our code I'll talk about is going to Mars, and I'll, I'll make that point. And there's an interesting term in the license for, on no account shall it be used on Venus. And you've got to get that in a... <laughs> you, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, for the avoidance of doubt, can be used for terrestrial and Martian applications, but on no account Venusian. Yeah, come on, you've got to get that line. You have to get that line in there. Okay, look, we haven't even started and I'm telling gags. Okay, so um, th this has got to be true. Okay, uh, it's a very important quote by me. Um, <laughs> and, and this happened, I got us, I, you know, uh, Oxford has a good system and you can get a sabbatical if you really whinge. And... Uh, <laughs> I, um, I whinged and I got a sabbatical and I sat and I thought, well, what is it that I want to do? And I thought, I don't want to have a career that's an archipelago of great papers. That, that was not enough. I want to build a honking great big mainland. Huge, okay? And the coast is where it gets interesting. And I want to grow that so you get something, something substantive. I want to capture the integral of everything that we do. I don't want to keep reinventing every year how to do that. And I thought, well, this is, you need an application domain. Excellent, I'm an engineer. I should come up with one of those. And it's transport was the first one that we latched on to. I think, I think we all agree that we maim and we kill, we waste time and we pollute because of cars. Now, if we started to build a car now as the excellent engineers that we are, if we said, hey, look, what we're going to do is we're going to take large swathes of the country and we're going to tarmac it and paint white lines on it and do whole loads of laws about it, and then we're going to generate vehicles that drive on it, they would not be car-shaped. Right, we wouldn't do it that way. The cars are like they are because they derive from a bloke sitting on a horse, pulling a trap. Okay, and it's derived from that. And it would be different now. And it is different now because we've got robotic science and we've got computers. So what difference does that make? And I'm going to talk about some of the differences that that's going to make. And it's going to be huge and it won't just be in cars. And it's truly exciting. And it's modern robotics lies at the heart of a solution. So what to do? Well, pretty obviously, let the cars drive. Excellent job done. OK, when you start teasing that apart, it becomes quite difficult. So here are some ideas. I think that the cars will drive some of the people, some of the time, in some of the places. OK, we won't start with a moonshot. There won't be a Tuesday or a Wednesday when suddenly there's cars with no steering wheels anytime soon. It's going to be graded. It will drive some of the people, some of the time, in some of the places. And the engineer's job is to drive some into more. So cars will drive more of the people, more of the time, in more of the places. And that is an arms race. And I'm interested in getting the technology that allows that to happen. And that technology does not depend on putting beacons or digging up roads. It's infrastructure-free navigation. The car should be independently clever, independently smart, and independently able to navigate. 
And this talk could have been about all kinds of things about self-driving cars, but I'm going to mostly make it about what interests me. And that's cars and vehicles answering the question, where the hell am I? Okay, which is a lot of your trouble when you're driving a car, when you get lost. Now, where does that mean? Where am I in the road? What's coming up? And I'll touch on some of the perception. But to have the perception stuff worked on, we need my colleague, Ingmar Paulsen, who's the other half, of the, uh, other half of the team here. So I'm going to just briefly touch on some of the perception. And this is important too, this last point. Let the cars get better at driving themselves over time. And that's important for all robotics. I think the era where we think you will unpack yourself a bright orange robot in a Honda plant and it will do a river dance for you and never get any better are limited. The machines will get better through use in the domain they use. And that's a very important part of our research. So, you know, do I, if you do um, driving makes me crazy as an image search in Google, you get this guy. <laughs> this is, and, and, and yeah, yeah, you know, so, you know, do we accept too much about driving? You know, must I always be in control? No, sometimes yes, because you're really good. You're really, really good. Sometimes. And other times you're just disastrous at it. And so there's a hybrid model here. Um, you know, are the roads really full? No, 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 no. If you took an aerial photograph and then you did counting of the pixels of cars, and then counted in pixels of road, and you divided A by B, you'd get a reassuringly small number. Okay? The roads aren't full at all. They're just full of cars being driven by Muppets. Okay? <laughs> you know, like spectacularly bad. I mean, how much space do you need when you're pulling onto the M40? You give yourself like 80 meters or something in front. But the car's going at the same speed. Your relative speeds are not much. It's just that you're making good life choices. <laughs> okay, I congratulate on those good life choices. So there's a, there's a cultural thing to change here as well. But, you know, these cars, um, we're not full. We're just not driving them well. Here's an important point to me. Why are the only the able drive? And this means a lot to me as my father. My father, he's, he's, um, he's getting old. And his world's starting to get a bit smaller. And it seems to me that it's exactly that time I want him to be getting out. Yeah, his feet are failing and, you know, that's when he should be able to get around. Exactly when your feet aren't working, sure, you need more cars. And, you know, his eyesight's going, you know, and, you know, we say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, you, you, you've, had, um, you've had a C-section, tough, you can't drive. What, that's the time you do want to be mobile. It's all backward. We say to drive a car, you've got to be a great, perfect, fully functioning human being. That seems to be wrong as well. So there's an access model here as well that's very important to us as engineers. Can I ask? Yeah, who, where are you? Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, please, he's good, you see. You said all these wonderful things. Yeah. What you're claiming, as far as I can see, is that queuing theory doesn't apply. Well, you can just get denser queues. <laughs> the spatial compactness of the queues is nuts. Because you've got humans there on all the wrong places. I'm not saying it all goes away. There will be problems in LA. But there shouldn't be problems on the A44. There's a lot of space on the A44. I don't say that it doesn't apply, I just say things get denser and things get slicker and you can calculate the shock waves that will be coming down, you can communicate if you want to do vehicle to vehicle. I think you would agree that it can't, it, that technology has to be able to perturb from where we are at the moment. Yes. How much? That's interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely. If, the, if everybody was all in the car at the same time, the roads might be too full. Okay, so you know this is about safety, access, efficiency, and quality of life. Um, okay, that was the end of the touchy-feely bit, and the motivation, which you should expect from an engineer. And I thought I'd now start to lead you through some of the how, if you're interested, on how we do some of these things. Very, very little maths, if any. Okay, it's good. It's Saturday. Yes, um, and I should be able to explain everything that's going on. And if you don't get it, just ask a question. Right, it's a talk. Um, and it keeps the people at the back awake. Is it really hot back there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that sucks to be sitting up there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> that was the love bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so how might a car know its position? And most people go, oh, you, sh oh, you should use GPS. Okay, you go, well, that's not okay. Um, so maybe. Uh, but for one thing, I'm not actually running a car group. I'm running a robotics group, and I'd like them to work in warehouses, down mines, in places where you can't get, you know, microwatts from space. And then anyway, I just said microwatts from space. That seems a very expensive way to have to navigate. And they have to build space rockets and stick things in orbit. That seems expensive, and then they wouldn't work in here at all. And anyway, I want 
sub-centimetre precision for navigating. And at the moment, if I get a good GPS in a completely huge blue sky area, yeah, I might get a metre. But in a normal city, you might get three, four metres adrift. OK, well, that's fine if you've got a big roundabout and there's no one else next to you. I don't want to be going round a roundabout with a guy next to me having four metres error and me having four metres error and hoping for the best. OK, um, that's not good. So, you know, it's, it's got, so you can, you, can, you can test what the problems are. So you can ask a grad student to stand in a road for a long period of time. <laughs> <coughs> I like the way they stood there rather than leaving their antenna and standing on the pavement. But they stood still, and this is the kind of motion that we got. So this is, you know, this is a quite a good GPS. Next to a building out of Bedbrook, we stood there. Are we getting, like, you know, six metres of error drift? And you're actually standing still. Ah, oh, there are tricks that you can pull and you can do GPS and you can do WAS and you can do RTK and you can spend lots of money. It's still a bit there. It's still a bit sad, really, that you've got to build space rockets to do it. So I got interested in, in, in a long time ago at Sydney, at doing away without having to use uh, GPS for the navigation because then we can apply this technology to so many domains. We can apply it into warehouses, we can do it for survey, we can do it underwater, you know, we can do it down mines and we can do it on Mars but not on Venus. OK, so let's start. I'm going to lead you on a story. And you might go, why is he tell telling me about low-cost survey generation? And I came to hear a thing about robot car. Well, it's because I'm going to tell you a story that gets you to self-driving cars and some of the tech that comes out along the way. And that's really exciting if you're thinking about commercialization. Because autonomous cars are a long way off. But how cool if on the way to there, being pulled towards that inexorably, towards this thing that is going to happen, there's things that you can produce on the way that have value and generate revenue and generate hard problems for us to work on as engineers. And I'm going to paint that story for you. So let's start with low-cost survey generation. Why? Because the cars are going to need to have a model of their world. And how might we do that? So one of the first things, I could give you a two-hour talk on just this tech, but this is something called visual odometry. Now, this is a little, this gold bar, it's a little stereo camera. You can just buy them on the interwebs and they arrive, and they've got two cameras, and you can plug them into your computer, and then you have to do a bit of fanciness. But basically, see, I'm going to just pause it here to show you, so you can see what's going on. Uh, hmm, interesting. Ah, oh. I can't pause it. If I could, I would have paused it. Well, can you see, there are little green dots, little green squares. I don't know if you can see it in the heat at the back. You might have too much heat haze to see it. <laughs> but um, a green dot means I'm seeing something in the left camera that I'm seeing in the right camera as well. And I've got a baseline between my two eyes. And so you can imagine that you could roughly triangulate how far away something is. That doesn't sound too hard, right? Now. So left to right can see a thing. But then I take another frame, left, right, I see another thing. What if I see the same thing? I could then start to track it through time. So now I have a web of interconnectivity. I have left to right correspondences and forward in time. So I have a temporal and spatial correspondences as I go through. And one of the things we can do in information engineering is invert sums. And so what you can do is you can say, hey, what must be the motion in six degrees of freedom that explains where those green dots are appearing in the image. Because the state of the universe that's being hidden is my motion, and I get to observe it through pictures. And that's the information engineering trick. We're always doing that kind of stuff. We're saying, I can't actually measure my motion, but I get these pictures. Can I infer from the pictures what my motion must be? And we can. And so this is a scale. Anyone recognize this college? Are you, are you the green hey. dots? Yes. Now, Sorry? Are you assuming the green dots are stationary then? Um, no. What we do is, if they weren't stationary, there would be no um, rigid body motion over time that could explain them by its own rigid body motion. So they'll get rejected. And so you'll see, I think, later... OK, I can't show you on that one. But you know, going through central London, the stuff that's on cars and stuff gets rejected. So absolutely not. But the, you do have to do some funky math to allow that in the optimization. Hi. You're going to wait 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, absolutely. OK, so we'll talk about nighttime driving as well. Um, but this is the survey stuff. This is just, right, this is just, am I able to figure out my rigid body motion? OK? It's not localizing something. It's like closed loop, open loop. 
Yeah, so I'm just moving through the environment, not watching anything, not tracking much, it's just open loop motion. Now, it's pretty good, okay? Um, how do you know one, one thing in one image matches the same thing in another image? Okay, because, well, that's good. So you can do some math. Again, it's this a trick that if there is no solution, you have to be able to find those things by explaining the motion. I must be able to find a motion that explains them. How we find the initial correspondences is we find a sharp corner. Say there's one here. There's a little bit of texture around that. Okay, so I take some properties, that a little bit of texture, and I see, do those properties, are they sustained from frame to frame? Okay, and are they moving in a way that could be explained by a rigid body motion? And so if something was moving itself on a leaf, you can't explain it. That's what the red ones are. They're the false ones that didn't pass the maths tests. Okay? And what sort of resolution, what detail do you look at? A little bit? Are you looking sort of a this is an excellent question. At the moment, we look in small, like four by four pixels. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to say what a stupid idea that is. So this is it in real time? Oh, yes. This is at 40 hertz. God, this is great. Is it using stir? Uh, no, it's just using fast. You know things. OK. <laughs> yeah. No, surf's too slow. OK. We use surf for the place localization stuff, but not for this. How much compute are you trying just to do that? Mm, do you have one of these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, easily. Uh, a Mac. Yeah, it's just, 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 just commodity hardware. Oh, very much so. <laughs> if you like, you could leave. <laughs> no, no, it's an abject fail. Um, <clears throat> no, no, we use Linux. The computers run, li the machines run Linux, the robots run Linux, and we develop in Mac because there's a nice duality between the two. Some of the best decisions I made, actually. Okay, so I have now onto my fourth slide of 60. <laughs> Excellent, this is great. No, please, if you, if you don't mind me running over, that's completely fine. Okay? Um, right, so I told you now I can solve for the six degree freedom motion. I wish I had a bar of my camera. I can't really. Is that used for something? something? Yeah, that's recording. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with using my hand. Okay, so I've now, I think, convinced you that I can come up with a rigid body motion of my. Uh, my hand, which is the camera. In fact, it's that code that we've licensed to the ExoMars project. So that's going uh, to the European Space Agency, um, developed by uh, with Dr. Winston Churchill, who's now the head of software in our, in our group. OK, now, what would happen if I attached said camera to a car and then also put a laser coming out of its back? So this is a jazz dance laser. OK, we need to think about this laser moving around like this. So it's a scanning laser. There's a guy, uh, Mike Smith, they did a PhD and spent his whole life doing jazz dance lasers. <laughs> Welcome back, Mike. OK, so, so here, can you imagine there's a, there's a curtain of laser light coming out the back of the car, and I've got this stereo on the front. Now, you can imagine then, so that laser is painting a curtain of laser light, range-bearing. As I move through the environment, can you imagine it carves out the 3D geometry of the world? Simple trick, patented. Interesting. OK, OK, that's nice. And you can build these nice models. So you can add some lasers. But be careful. It's not as easy as you think. Because this is the sickness in the group that's everywhere, is calibration. It's really, really, really hard. There's two kinds of calibration that worry us. Spatial calibration and temporal calibration. You can imagine that if I've got a car that's moving at 40 miles an hour and it's turning quite swiftly and seeing something 100 metres away, if you get the temporal calibration, between the measurements of the camera and the laser wrong, you're wrong by five, ten meters, which is the, of the order of a car, which you might care about lots. Okay, or you drive slowly, but nah, it's not really what you want. That calibration turned out to be one of those things. It's what I love about being an engineer. We, we did this, we had this thing, Summer of Code at Begbrook. So I said, come on, guys, we're going to pack up in information engineering. We're going to hire a garage at Begbrook. And we hired this crappy old garage. It was terrible, it was dusty. And we just tried to start doing the simplest thing. We said, you know what, guys, I'm going to take a hit. We won't publish any papers this summer. We're just going to do a piece of systems stuff together as a team and to find out what we really don't know. That's a really hard thing to do as an academic, but I was sure we needed to do it to actually start to build something. And then uh, as a, uh, a student came to me, Alistair Harrison, a postdoc, and he, he was outraged. And he goes, time goes backwards up here. I hate it. 
I said, what do you mean? And he goes, look at your timestamps. They've gone backwards. And he goes, there's a thing here. I said, how, just to one side, how can this be? And I said, oh, you know, it's going to be fine. He goes, no, there's a thing here. And by going and trying to integrate it, we found we had a problem with time calibration that had been everywhere, but we'd never noticed. And he got his PhD just from doing that instead of just. And he came up with a new way to do timing calibration. And it's pretty funky. So this is the kind of errors that you can get. What we did is we took a laser and a camera, and we just ran them next to each other for a week. And we looked at the drift of their clocks. They've got clocks, so they've got internal clocks. And they send data out at a regular thing. And there's, you can see there's a couple of frequency components here. Anyone guess? This is 24 hours, 0 to 24. Anyone guess what that cycle is? Is air conditioning. Yeah, OK. And this is in milliseconds on the side. What about the low frequency one? Period of a week. It's low pressure from the Atlantic coming through. So when, the air, when for example, the air conditioners go on in the car, all the clocks drift. We had to worry about that. And this, you know, those are huge skews. And so we worry about that in real time. So I find that fascinating about my job, is when you get into it, there's little bits of detail that you could skip over, but the kind of people that we have working around here go, no, 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 you will not pass. The fact it was possible for time to go backwards means we have a big problem. And you cannot say, ah, I should be right. <laughs> yeah, was, that, that was my Australian times. OK, and, and we nailed it. And it's really interesting. And again, this is now something that you can, you can download this code from our website, and it's one header file. So now, what you could do is you could take all of that stuff, and you could stick it in a device. And we've called it a Naboo, and I think you might have seen it over there. And it's a device that's got a camera in it, and we built this. And then we drive it around. We took it up to you at house when I went for a pitch for some money. And we drove around the car park. And look at the detail we're building in these 3D maps here. Now, this is done with no GPS whatsoever. You just pick this thing up, and you just drive. And it's building extremely detailed 3D models of the world. That in itself is a valuable thing. And I can talk to you about why. You know, I have to look at this, this, this here. Look, this is a model of a car. And this is in laser light in this tree. That's all coming from laser. Drive around today. Once. Just once. You just drive. Yes, no surveyor involved. It does make it hard to sell it to surveyors. <laughs> 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 it's the sort of thing you realize when you're leaving <laughs> the pitch. <laughs> Um, but yeah, th that's interesting. Oh, so the idea is there is that it won't be as good as if you spend 200 grand on an RTK GPS and an extraordinary laser. So that's not the market you should go for. Because if you engineer it and you actually go, well, we're going to get into the hardware, you can probably do a better job. But we're trying to pitch this at a couple of grand is what we'd like to do. I would like to make it cheaper. I, r I really like it. Oh, what I'm hoping for is someone built, we're going to build something. I'm scared of picking nothing. Oh, look at this. I could have used that for my camera. Oh. I'd like to build something that sort of size that you just wander around and surveys. I'd like to be able to take that into oil refineries, and I'd like to be able to, heads of fire chiefs, be able to walk through old buildings and go, OK, there's the building, and on the way back, where the fire risks by looking at the geometry of the building. There's so many things you can do with this. Um, so why does that still play? Yeah, so um, once again, tell a grad student to go into London and drive. And then we just drove through London and built these kind of surveys. Again, just while driving through traffic. Um, and that's interesting. And now we're back to mapping cities. You might be able to guess where we're going. I'm sorry, sir, I forgot right. your question. I was, I was going to ask a much more general question, really. Um, you've already mentioned the word pattern of space. <laughs> Are you trying to use those in source to get a big community? Because obviously, We open source some of the stuff. So some of the stuff I do, I do open source. Yeah. And some of the stuff I don't. Um, some of the stuff we open source three years after we've exhausted the academic merit from it so we can get ahead. So some of the stuff that um, uh, has gone into our place recognition you can download, but all of it is not open sourced. That also is important when you think about the way that we fund the group as well. So if we're working with a lot of industrial partners, and we do, you might not want to be open sourcing that stuff. But what we don't do is keep secrets about how we do stuff. But that's OK, because you could read all the papers you want in the world, but until the magic source is on that laptop, well, it's probably out of date now. But yeah. Hello. You've got human error in cars that were driven by people. Yeah. How do you make sure you eliminate any human errors from the computer? There will be accidents, and they will be different accidents, and we need to get to grip with this. It's a really important point. I think it is a fallacy to say that self-driving cars will eradicate um, all accidents straight away. 
there will be accidents that happen and they will not be the accidents that a human would have let happen. I think we need to start having that conversation now, but they should be fewer. That's the big important point. Okay, there are different accidents because of planes than donkeys. Okay, and horse travel and cars, and it's safer to go on a plane than it is to get in a car, but they're different kinds of accidents. And we need to start having this conversation about robots <coughs> helping us in the kind of accidents that they cause. Because every engineer knows you can't make a product from the scratch that's got five sigma performance. What you can do is say there should be process so we can understand what's going on. And it's insurable. We don't need to get spooked that this is some sort of thinking machine that somehow cannot be assessed what the risk is. And so just like all engineering products, you go through methodology, you do functional specs, and you test it, and you go, and you would make the cars drive some of the people in some of the time in some of the places. And that's the trick, because you only the car itself tries to only offer you autonomy in the places that it thinks it is safe to do so, and the insurance companies that just offered that certificate for insurance for that one kilometer of travel for you in your car in that place on that day. The next day you might not get insurance for that and the green light offering your autonomy may not come on because there's something funky happening with a drain that's being blocked. And earlier cars that are driven through that weren't autonomous spotted that, so insurance has been revoked for that part of the road. There's already been a crash. Has yeah, there's a brilliant paper. It's my, my old boss at MIT. He wrote the first paper on the first robot crash. <laughs> two two cars, two robot cars crashing. Really interesting. Really interesting. And we need, there's a cultural discussion to be had around this. And one of the immediate things, of course, is that, hey, you know, I'm sure none of you have had a car crash <laughs> or a ding. But if you're like me, there's a bit you have to fill in at the bottom of the form. There's a little picture of what happened. Yeah. What do you mean, what happened? There's only one thing. What do you need to tell a story about it? The cars know. They will have recorded this. So immediately, even if they're not offering full autonomy, the sensor suite could be on. So immediately there's an interest there for insurance companies of even autonomy isn't offered, but you know what's going on. And maybe there's a 10 second buffer of memory that's always in a perception. There is no, oh, I think you did that, no, you did that, or let's take it to court. It's known. There's all kinds of things that happen before you have full blown autonomy really, really makes me interested in working in this area because there's this pull, this is great big attractor, but you don't need the whole thing to do good stuff. All right, rock and roll. So why might that be useful? Well, uh, you might want to be, who cares about potholes? <laughs> why don't you look for potholes? Yeah, so this is what we're going to do. So this is Sheffield, as you can tell, because it's hilly. So that little stick there, that's actually in a boo and uh, the team went up to Sheffield and they did driving and they built these maps and what we're looking at now is machine learning to identify the potholes. Again, it's just free. Okay, this is an offshoot of something we need for the autonomous car anyway, so that's interesting. And I love that about robotic science. I didn't say let's start a transport group. I said let's run a robots group and let's find lots of applications and here are some. That's pretty good, isn't it? I like that. Okay, and so what my colleague uh, Ingmar Posner is doing is saying, hey, why don't we now just try and find all the windows that predate 1930 because they've got terrible energy efficiency and then we could know where cities need help in terms of energy efficiency. Or maybe we want to um, look for block drains or maybe we want to predict where that road is going to freeze and you're going to get heave failure in the roads. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so maybe you want to go in and you may be interested in actually measuring how big your city is and actually really measuring it. And the point is we can do this really cheaply. You, there's many ways you could do this. It's really expensive though. Um, so, and then we can, you know, do things that like we can colour these point clouds. Uh, and you could, so another thing is we're doing our, with our friends Guidance, who we work very closely with, a project on railways. So it turns out you don't know where most stuff of railways is. Okay, most of the stuff on railways is lost. I don't know how they lost it, but they did. And um, they're really keen, so we stick a Naboo on a train. Okay, and we're going to build 3D maps in colour of trains. You might be interested in what the embankments are like. Are they a bit steep, getting a bit overgrown, got a bit of a subsidence issue? Uh, have you lost some cable? Well, and it hasn't been nicked yet. You know, there's, there's all, all kinds of things you can do. Again, it's about infrastructure monitoring. Um, in warehouses, for yes. 
At the moment, we can go on a car, we can go about 35, 40 miles an hour. That's simply a, fa a facet of how fast the lasers scan. Okay, you get a faster laser, it's fine. This is, this is fairly simple tech here. Um, okay, another thing, asset removal. So we can train a computer to point it at cars and say, these, they, by the way, are cars, and say, okay, well, go through a city and remove all the cars. Why is that interesting? We won't worry about parking. Or you might actually want to pull out where all the cars are. Cars may not be interesting, but windows and front doors might be, or cable might be. God knows what assets you're looking for, but you can find these things by teaching a machine and we're building some quite nice user interfaces. So once again, we're trying to build software that you could give to someone, whatever their domain is, and you might say, I'm really, really interested in my building of finding where all the plug sockets are, because I need to replace them. So you just walk someone through a skyscraper and hear all the plug sockets. I want to know where all the ventilation outlets are. Maybe you're walking through a half-built warehouse, not warehouse, a half-bit building, and you really care that the girders are in the place that you said you were going to put them. Because if they're six inches to the, in the wrong place, in a year's time, you won't be able to get the air conditioning unit through and you've got a snag. Again, we're looking at doing that and that portable unit for that. OK. So that's interesting, I think. And it's a precursor. It's like one out of 10 steps that we have. Can I, yeah, can please I do. One? Can you make one? Can I buy one? Uh, huh. Sure, after Wednesday. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Let me give. You, I'll talk to you afterwards about this. Yes, yes, that's our idea. Our plan is literally to sell these things. I'm not the business manager. No way am I saying that in a public lecture. No. Um, we hope the target price to be an order of magnitude less than you would expect buying a commercial survey unit. I should start a company, this is going to be easy. He just said, yeah. OK, uh, so now I've got those maps. Um, what could we do with them? Let's, let's now move towards navigation. So I've talked about the intrinsic value there of the map itself. That's interesting as an offshoot. What might we do with that? So what you could do is you could get yourself a car. And I'll talk more about the robot car. Here it is. And you could stick that, row, that laser at the end. Now. There you go. Oh, look at that. I love that. It doesn't actually look like that. It's not quite that scary as, <laughs> as it drives. OK, but now here's the trick. Now, I've gone through and I've built that laser map. Now, as I go through with my Jazz Dance hands live, can you imagine as I'm moving, I've got my little VO that's giving me a local field of motion. I could assemble a local, what we call a swathe of laser light. It might only be three or four meters long. And what I could then do is I could match that local swathe to where I think I am globally in the world. And you might just try and match it, that's a bad idea. What you tend to look at is you try and look at the statistics. There's certain statistics, if I moved in this way, just grazing Lionel there, there's certain statistics, all about statistics, of the shape of this room. And doing it statistically allows you for someone to be standing up and it changing in some way. So we say statistically, the local swathe has to be feasibly generated by the global map. Is it possible the local swathe could have been generated as if the points in the map that I built earlier were sampling themselves and generating samples? And you might say, no, it isn't. And you go, that's a sad thing. What if I was here? And you do it again. What if I was here? What if I was here? And you run loads and loads and loads of hypotheses. So you just run a stupid thing thousands of times a second, and you can find out where you are. We call mm -hmm. this L3NAV, and that's one way to navigate at night because laser works at night. Okay. So what we did is we took vision data to build a prior, and then you can use lasers. So those, those lasers are fairly, where did I put my thing? Those lasers are fairly cheap, but they're not, not massively cheap. So I'll start to talk about how you could use vision-based navigation in a moment. So I think before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit, not really my error, but the perception, which Ingmar Porzner does. And so we can overlay on these maps semantic information. So this is the road network around Begbrook. What are you seeing here? Here's the paths, here's the, the rules of the road. These, can you see these green and yellow splodges? Those are real-time feeds of stuff that the laser, and this is one thing on Ibeo, out the front that's just looking for some obstacles out the front is seeing. There's, this means a roundabout, here's some road markings. And so you can layer on the top of the where, the map, some semantics. Uh, that's an interesting thing, uh, and it's needed. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So let's talk now about dropping the laser at runtime, and let's start talking about using vision only, okay? Because vision, everyone's got a USB camera, it's cheap. 
you must be boiling at the back. I'm really, are you really, really hot? There's still nothing I can do about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things I talked about was learning from experience. One of the things we're really trying to do, and I'm going to come back to the end of the talk, this was after we did a big press demo uh, about a year and a half ago around Begbrook. That was a scary day. Um, we said, well, let's remove the, vision, the laser system and try and do it off, uh, off, off a laser camera. So now what we're doing is we've gone through, we've taken our, our, our visual odometry system, and it's remembered where all the green splodges were. Okay, it stuck them into memory. And then you try and go through again, and you just say, well, can I recall where those green splodges are? And I absolutely love this video is doing that. So what you're seeing here, this is the live view, okay, at runtime. This is a block of memory. And what's happening is I match the live view to the memory view, okay? And then if that's right, I remember what came next. So I then load that from memory and compare the two. So if you like, you're walking through a spatial memory of images as you go around. Yes, yes. The cam because, the because this looks, should look the same for all cameras. I'm going to talk about making it the same for all cameras soon in terms of what do you do if the lighting changes completely? What happens if you go out in the snow? We've got a video of that coming up. And so what if the memory didn't make sense, if the live view didn't make sense vis-a-vis -vis your memory, you have a new memory. You have a new look of what the environment looks like. So if you were used to going out in the sun and then suddenly it snowed, Nothing works. You remember snow as a new memory, as a new experience. This was something with just such a simple paper. And I remember sitting out of Pegbrook and I got out and it was a blizzard and I thought, this looks nothing like August, we're doomed. Okay, because all of my heritage from uh, my, my PhD had been about building das Ubermap, you know, building the one and true representation that can be used in all weathers. And we threw it out and we said, you know what? No, I bet the world's got a finite number of faces and we'll just memorise them. And it turned out we call it experience-based navigation. It's really transformed what we're doing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, what sort of cameras can we use? So we love these. These are, these are amazing cameras. Uh, they're normal cameras, but the lenses have a 185-degree field of view. What? Some of the light's coming from behind? This, yeah, OK. Um, it does. So this angle between this pixel and this pixel is 185 degrees. So massive field of views, massive distortion. And you might have seen these cameras dotted around the car, very wide field of views. And what we're trying to do is build navigation systems that can navigate just by using those camera feeds and the 3D prior. Now who can imagine, just if I just gave you those by itself, anyone got any idea why I can't localise metrically, meaning in metres? So if I just had a single camera on my webcam, I do there, it's not on, why can't I actually figure out where I'm in meters? If I had a single USB camera on my web phone, someone who knows isn't like, yeah, go, do you know actually? Absolutely, right, because, was, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to make the Star Wars movie. What did you just say? Yeah, seriously. So because in just a single camera view, you can't get scale because a camera is a bearing measuring device. Really? Yes, it is because all a camera does is say, I saw a pixel and it's green and it comes in that direction. Okay, that emergency light could be a kilometre high and 50 kilometres away. I just can't tell. That's also one of the reasons that machine vision is so damn hard is because I only know it's probably not because I've walked through doors before and I grew up knowing of my dimensions roughly. Okay, I've got a friend who says, if you'd never seen a jumbo jet in the sky and you'd be next one, you'd have no idea what its size is, and that's true. And so, you know, who knows the, be you know, the beginning of the Star Wars films and these huge, huge ships are going over. Am I in danger of looking like a... Come on, you're engineers. You know what? I'm give, give me some love here. You know what I'm talking about. The huge ships that come through. Okay, and what he does is he builds scale up in a clever way. The first one comes through and you can see little windows and you've got all windows. Okay, I've got some sense. Whoa, that's huge. And then this other one comes up, another order of 10. You go, whoa, that's huge. And it just goes on and on and on. Because otherwise, that gives you that sense of scale. And that's because you're bringing your human context into your memory of experience of the physical world. You can't get it through single images. So what we want to do is exactly that. We want to come up 
with metric positions, X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw, using only cameras. Well, I just explained that's flawed, very hard to do. I'm going to do it with one camera, unless, of course, you happen to drive a laser through a city and have a metric map, because there's metric knowledge in there. So what I'm going to talk about next, I think, yeah, is how you could use a metric model, memory of a city, to localise with a single camera. OK. Why are you restricting yourself to a single camera? Cheap. It's just cheaper to buy two. They're dirt cheap. Uh, it is. It is. You still have a calibration problem. Seriously, you have the calibration problem. It's really hard. And it would be nice, just so we can use end cameras, but what if the end cameras are looking in different directions? So that'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it, to be able to have one camera there, one camera there, and have two. Or what if one camera fails? So I agree, stereo is great, and I'm going to talk to you about we can do it just with a stereo camera as well. Another problem that you have with stereo is you can only get X, Y, and Z up to scale if your baseline is absolutely huge. Right? So if I had a baseline of 12 centimetres, I'm not going to know where I am if I'm looking something 50 metres away because you get a 1 over r squared error term coming up. So the further something away is, the square of the error you get in terms of your ability to judge its depth. So actually, when you're perceiving a mountain, you've got stereo, but you have no idea of its distance. And so if you wanted to have something that controlled in x, y, and z, you have to have something really close to you, and you might not. Does that help? He's not sold. I'm going to come back to him. <coughs> Well, that is kind of parallax, isn't it, from stereo? Uh, they're not looking forward. So if I oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, absolutely. Absolutely, if I just have the camera looking forward, everything rushes past you, so we do have things. That's why we went for the 360 view, if we can. OK, so I think we talked about building these survey vehicles, or building these surveys. Now, here you go. Here's a little, just a little bit of an explanation. This is an algorithm I'm going to explain uh, called LAPS, um, created by my PhD student, Alex Stewart, and it's a good idea. Imagine I've got a world and it's got a yellow, a blue, and a red box in it. Those are the buildings. And I sample it with my Naboo, with my laser system, and I get these crosses, these stars on it. Yeah, those are laser points I've measured from my sparse point cloud. OK, with that so far? Right. Now, I could then project those images, those points, if I knew where I was, into an image. Right? So if I knew where the camera was, relative to the 3D model of this room, I could stand here and I could project those laser points into it. I would know where they are, right? Now, imagine I now moved, whoop, and I did some transformation. I've got a different place where that camera is. Again, if I knew the transformation from here to here, I could project those laser points back into the image, and it would look right. Yeah, because I'm, doing, I'm, I'm sort of synthesizing a camera. I could do that exactly right. But if I didn't get it right, if I, if I thought I knew the transformation to image B, but it was all messed up, everything projects wrong because I've got my picture of down this view of my yellow square, my blue square, and my, my red cubes. I've got my picture, but the laser points aren't projecting into the right place. In fact, the colors that the laser points pick up are wrong. So this point is this point, this point is this point, this one is that. The colours are right. Those laser points are projecting into my live image and picking up the right colours. They're blue, if I get it right. But if they're wrong, well, one of them is two of them are blue and one of them is yellow, and these two are blue and they should both be yellow. Something's wrong. Okay? If only I could get the right thing. So what you can do is you can do colour counting, literally. You can build a histogram of the colours that you're getting of these points. You don't care where they are, you literally just count up how many blues, how many yellows, how many reds. And if you're in the right place, they should match. So here you go. This is somewhere. <laughs> uh, and there's some laser okay, between the two. Now what's interesting, we've done the cut, we've done, these are histograms of intensity. So this here is zero, meaning deep black. This over here is bright white. Okay. And this transformation to this transformation is known. I've got the camera in the right place, so I'm projecting it right. You can see these histograms are quite similar. So what I can do is I can compare histograms. Oh, now I'm feeling principled. Now I'm feeling I'm doing something statistical because I can say strong statistical things about comparing histograms. This feels like something information engineers should do. This one's just wrong. Okay, so here's the trick. What you do is you optimize. In other words, I screw around with the transformation until this histogram 
It's as close to that histogram as it looks like you can get. The cool thing about this is everything that was white here could go to black over there. It doesn't matter. There's an entropy argument. You can com completely invert the colours. Or you could change all the colours by the same amount. In other words, the sun could go in. Okay? And it's, and it's immutable. So you're not going red for red. Red could go deep, deep orange under sodium lighting. And you can have that, I that insensitivity, which is cool. Uh, and this is it. I'm going to skip to this video. This is generated yesterday. So this is the latest result we have coming out of the group. So this is it driving around Walton Street. What you're seeing here is the result of the optimization. You're trying to minimize something. And this is X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw. These are the errors relative to an expensive GPS. And this is, you can see here, this is the live survey. No, so, sorry, this is the stored survey of Oxford that we drive around. And here's the car solving for its position. And here are the live camera views it's getting. So here's one view from the camera. And there's a 3D point cloud being projected into it. it it's hard to see on the lights, I'm afraid. It's quite dark. But this is pretty exciting. So this is now a very cheap way to navigate. You go through, you build your survey. But with a camera, we're now able to solve for X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw. And we're, we're pretty pleased with that. How am I doing for time? I haven't been watching it at all. Eva will tell me. How, how many minutes do you want? Five minutes more, 10 minutes, or 15? Who wants five minutes more? Who wants 15 minutes more? An hour. An hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, great. I'll give you 15 more minutes because it gets a little bit faster. What I might do is skip the bit about what the future of robotics is because who cares? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's talk about a little bit about the perception. It's not, it's not really my area. So this is like, ooh, there's amazing stuff. Uh, going on that's, that's from, from in one, I'll tell you why it's important. So one of the things that we obviously need to do is where the hell's the road as well? So perceiving where the road is in front of you is something that Dominic Wang has been done. And again, if you've got those models of what you think the road should be, you can project the road into your images and then you might decide to run your classifiers to look for objects very carefully just on those roads. Um, hey, this is quite interesting. So talk about those classifiers. You might say, well, hang on, I want to make sure I see all the cars. So you might train a classifier up for the cars. But what if there's something, what if there's a camel on the road? You, want to, you, you don't want to have a camel detector. And if you've got a camel, you know, what if there was like barrels, some barrels had fallen over or there was a cone? How many detectors are you actually going to run? So we had this idea that if we'd built this 3D prior we'd gone through. Now, if I knew where I was, oh, by the way, we solved that problem. We've done the localization. What I could do is I could project the 3D model into my image, and if I know how I'm moving, I should know how the scene should be moving past me. I could synthesize what the world should be doing. And basically, you can just difference the image from your camera, which is just in 2D, from the image that's synthesized because you had the 3D structure. And if something doesn't match, something's very wrong. In other words, there's an obstacle of some sort there. And what we're seeing here is this should not be there. But we have not built a van detector. This says don't trust anything here. OK? <laughs> don't do it. The only bit to trust, and it's learned this, is just that bit there. It's not moving, but this is just wrong. This is done by uh, Colin McManus, and it's, it's pretty cool. So normally you might say, oh, you build yourself a van detector, or a car detector, and a bike detector. I said, well, that's just too scary. There's just there's something that shouldn't be there. Just build that filter. Again, we can just do this How from the camera. How do you get the prior? How do you get the object at the prior? Um, do you remember that I showed you that step where I said I could remove the cars? Yes. That. The cars are That's right. So what we do is we go through, we'd go through multiple times, right. and you'd find the stable thing. So the tri what goes wrong is if something massively structural changes. Okay. Then we would say that's a distraction and shouldn't be there. And it's true, because it is a distraction. It shouldn't be there, modulo that being your prior. Right. Yeah. And that's working quite well. And then there's things you should be doing about being able to read the road as well. So we call this reading the road. Can you understand what these, these road markings are? I mean, in reality, I think what you do is you'd write down that there's a junction here. And you'd write down where every street light is and where every, uh, every road marking is as you go around. But these are, these are competencies that you have to have as you build towards a more complicated autonomous car. And then you, would, you might decide, actually, cars are such a special case, you would build a car detector. And so here's when you can download these things off the road for a car detector and a lane detector. And then here are things that would move. So you might build things for obstacles that are actually going to be particularly dynamic and you should be watching out for. 
and this is the side of the group that, that Ingmar Porsner does. So we have, a, we have a brilliant working relationship. I do, I do the where and he does the what. Works really well. And it turns out the law of the what depends on the where, on where you are. So there's a really interesting combination between the two of us there. Uh, and this, in fact, is exactly that. Here he is learning to drive down North Oxford and he's learning here to classify cars. He goes again and again and again and again. Now, I can't tell you the technical detail of this right now for, for some pretty obvious reasons, but you're seeing it's getting better on every day. He drives down that. That's really important to the way that we think of working, is that let's not take a holiday and say, there's our competency. We want the cars to get better through use. And this car is getting better through use in North Oxford, particularly down these streets. But that's OK, because your commuter routes are fairly standard. So your car gets better for you. And Imar's a big proponent of your car, your vehicle, your robot, your energy system getting better for you because of your personal use. I think that's absolutely fascinating. How do you pick up the um, road signs, etc.? Um, uh, well, there's two things you could do. So you can run a detector in the images that is particularly tuned for those lines. You can run what we call specialist detectors, and that's absolutely fine. Or you can write down that they're there because they change so rarely. So one car could go through and you can have a background service that's just distributing that to all the cars. OK. OK, so bringing that all together, we went to Nissan, the dealership in Kidlington, and uh, we bought a car. It was amusing. We went in and we were sponsored by Nissan. And we said, uh, we're looking at the Leafs. And we were there and we were underneath and we had taken the boot out. And you know, I went in, it was a jeans t-shirt day. I almost came jeans t-shirt today. And I'm there and I'm doing some engineering. The salesman comes and says, you know, what are you doing? Oh, we were thinking of um, buying two of these cars. He goes, what? And he really didn't like us. And I said, yeah, we're going to make it drive itself. And he says, leave. And then, <laughs> and then, then our friend from Nissan came and says, oh, yes, from Nissan. Tokyo main branch, this guy's face was just absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> but here, here comes a conundrum, what do you do? So you're sponsored by Nissan to buy a car, do you deal at the dealership? <laughs> I, I couldn't compute that at all, it was just an infinite recursion. I was going, wait, do I knock? Do I try and get 10 grand off the cost of it? I'll have two of them. He goes, what, a full ticket price? And what do you do? So we've got some free car mats. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So uh, we, took, we took a leaf, um, and we all told him, now that was an interesting thing to do with the research group as well. So I said to the guys, well, why don't we have a go? Again, let's go down for four months. It's diffi I have to say it's difficult to do this at Oxford because it's just a one-size-fits-all for grad students. But I said, no, I am going to do this. We are going to spend four months, and we're going to turn ourselves from a pack of cats into a herd of dogs to chase this one down. Okay? And we're going to see how far we can get in building an autonomous car. We won't be able to compete with Google. <coughs> But let's see what we can do. It was absolutely fascinating. The stuff I learned in doing that, and how to lead a team, how to manage your risk, how to do that in the context of a research group, whilst not shutting the group down, has been fantastic. And it was one of the best things I did. And we're going to do it again. Uh, it's interesting. It's a really interesting to do. And it really benefited the group. So we did. And we took all the tech that I showed you and put it into a car. And in the end, the science minister came. And you press a button. And it does drive him around. Um, and this has been an exciting thing for us. And we're about now, we've got one, two more weeks of hell of paper writing to get through. Beginning of October, we're going to go again. And we're going to take all the new tech that's been developed over the past 18 months. And, and, and Will Madden, who's the senior postdoc that leads it, we're going to push again and see how far we can get. So again, I explained how this navigated. This is just driving around Begbrook. Um, again, you know, it's all driven by an iPad. Very interesting interface. You have to think very carefully about the safety cases for how you can distract a driver. So it offers the driver autonomy, tells you what to do, and offers you autonomy, and you're off. And we were parked on a chicane, so it looks a little hairy there. It's great. <laughs> oh, come on, that's the best job in the world, isn't it? That's a good question. This is, this is the best question. We don't know how to do that. We do not know how to get... It, uh, autonomy going one way is easy. I let you take over. But, dear God, come back now. <laughs> That's really hard, right? Because the human is doing God knows what. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, colleague Natasha Marrett from, from Leeds, 
she's got some scary numbers and she says it can take a minute for a human to fully integrate the scene around them okay that's scary so one thing you could do is the car would not be autonomous in a place that's so complex that a human would need to come back and couldn't do it at that place the other thing you do is you just stop okay so if the human can't do it then you just go what I think for a long time these will be driver assist systems as well. I, I really do. Um, not just get me there. And for one thing, of course they're going to be, because if I could build something with two sigma performance, you'd be pretty happy. But if it drops you 500 meters from where you wanted to go, that's really annoying. <laughs> OK? Uh, and there's a real thing with robots. Trying to build a system that does the whole thing, five sigma performance, that's really a stupid thing to try and do for a product. So that's why it's some of the people, some of the time, in some of the places, not all of the people all of the time, in all of the places. All right, um, how are we doing? That's right, but five out of six landings, I think, are autonomous now, right? One in six has to be for the human, just in case. Yeah, yeah. It's a hell of a lot easier to fly a plane, though. <laughs> like, it's like, you have to try hard to hit stuff. <laughs> like, you have to really really try hard. I mean, it's spectacular when you do, <laughs> but it's the inverse of our problem, is we have to try spectacularly hard to not hit stuff. <laughs> 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 Could you just ask, is there any correlation between what you're doing and what surgeons are doing? Because I've recently come to the colorectal and blah, 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 and there were five different departments looking at being tied. And I asked because I was interested, and they said, it's been the most interesting exercise so that the nucleus is excited it. Yeah. And the colorectal, the color, uh, 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 yeah. put together. So they, they had a root map. When they went into surgery, they had a root map. And I, all you were saying, I'm thinking, is that what happened? There are some people who are trying to take this tech to mapping human bodies as yeah. well. Yeah, so there, are, there are. Uh, well, no. I know someone that's tried. Yeah. The textures that are inside your body are a lot more challenging. Oh, yeah. um, and also, it really does change from day to day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's an easier way to do surgery. You, know? you would probably instrument the whole place because it's such a controlled environment. Uh, and that's a big difference is I want to build machines that can go pretty much anywhere. Whereas almost by definition, a surgery where you're in an operating theatre, that is the ultimate in bespoke environments. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly information engineering is, or as Lionel will profess, information engineering, well, we're going to own medics. Okay. <laughs> Okay, because you know we just we just know more stuff. Actually, no, we can infer more stuff. That's the difference. We can infer it. Hi. You've talked a lot about specialist capturing and processing and using statistics. Isn't in the end, isn't socially collective collective information going to have the biggest contribution? Ta da! And who's this? All the cars share it. Mm. Yes, yeah, so this is all shared. It's not just one car. They're all sharing it because there's these guys that make NG. Yeah, and they're going to share. That's all built for us. It's great, like the computers. That's going to happen. So you might be first up into Aylesbury in the morning, and the light doesn't come on for you. It's a bit sad. Woman 30 yards behind you does, because you just drove it. And so you verified that route. It doesn't take long to drive all the roads in the UK. So massively sharing this stuff. That's obviously going to happen. Everything's going to be shared. Everything's going to be shared. Yeah. Privacy will mean something different. Yeah. And you seem to be doing it with just one system. No, we've got about five navigation systems. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And indeed, on this project, oh, by the way, here's the first UK road trial. So it's the first time a car drove itself on the UK's roads autonomously. This was the dullest experiment ever. Seriously. <laughs> you, seriously, you want to you wanna turn up and say to your safe officer, Richard, oh, we're going to go live on the roads. So he goes, Boop, and you go, it's OK. And you turn up and you go drive down the road and you go back and the green light comes on, you press it, the car drives you and you go home and you write it up. Okay, but this was cool. So first time I did it in the UK on public roads. So we can, we can, we, I've, that's interesting as acronym was working with the Department for Transport to get the license to go on the road. Now that's a quiet thing for Oxford. We haven't gone huge on it, but we've had it a year. All the stuff that you hear in the press about driverless challenge
Yeah. Which is so much better than being off the edge of it. <laughs> this was our plan. OK, so what's coming next is we've just signed a deal. Who's heard of the, the Milton Keynes Pods project? You might have heard of this. We, my group heard about it from Have I Got News For You. <laughs> and we were a joke on Have I Got News For You. Uh, and that's us. And so we will be, uh, in 2016, there will be autonomous pods taking you from the station to the shopping centre in Milton Keynes with Oxford University NAV running it. Pods will be built by RDM. This stuff matters. OK, now that is... Boop, a scary thing to do as an academic research group, okay? So come on, let's have a go. Okay, let's have some impact and find out what we can do. And now we'll have conversations with my head of department <laughs> about what will be needed to do that. But we're gonna do that, okay? Because that's gonna take it from the lab and it's gonna do something in a trial and the nation will watch and we'll have the car on the road at the same time. And we're gonna do that. And I'm pretty excited about working with the transport catapult to do this. Uh, I think I've run out of time. Um, It's where the transport catapult was built. <laughs> no, it is too. It's, it's nice for that. It can be rerouted. But these things will be on the pavement, interestingly. These are going to be next to people, and the pods should be arriving across the road in about two to three months, we think. That's exciting. Uh, I think I'm going to call it that. I would have talked to you about all the challenges. Oh. So you want me to go for more? Yeah? OK. Uh, he says 10 more minutes, I'll do what the boss says. OK, so dealing with change is crucial. So this is going around Deadpool. Look how the weather conditions change. We need to be able to navigate in those changing conditions. Now, you could say, hey, do it with a laser, but I want to be able to do this with cameras as well. So how might we deal with this? Now, one of the big things, the changes come from shadows. And there was an interesting thing. You sometimes have this sort of virus that went around the group. Someone last year said, I found a way to remove the shadows. They didn't quite speak like that, but, you know. <laughs> but, and they went, really? <laughs> and they said, yes, try this line of code. And they sent a line of code around, and that afternoon, all of our shadows had gone from our images. And we borrowed this from, from some of the literature in, in, in image processing. Um, and that's, forget that, uh, how, how shudders of people. That in Basically, what I'm trying to say is here, if you know something about your light source, we should call it the sun, Right? You can look stuff up about that. Okay? And then um, if you know, don't know much about this, but you do know an awful lot about your camera, and you can make those, and you can look stuff up about your camera. It turns out there's a transform that you can do, that you take some amount of your red, your green, and your blue pixels, and you do a funky transform that's determined by the temperature of the sun and the qualities of your camera. Okay? You can combine the red, green, and blue pixels in such a way that the shadows disappear because the shadows are a function of sunlight. You've still got background scatter coming through in blue light. It won't work in sodium, but it works outdoors. And look at the kind of results you get. So one line of C code. So here's an image gone to there. So you do lose some damage, but the shadows have been disappearing. So one of the things we started to do is put that into the visual odometry system so now it doesn't get distracted by all these shadows under trees. And we've got an instant improvement, which is, which is pretty interesting. And there's the transform. So we run the baseline system, the visual odometry, and then also this shadow removed system at the top. And in some places where the shadows become really tr problematic, the background system that's using the, the light invariant system swings into action, and you get much better performance. There's no reason not to use this. And the last thing I wanted to get at for you, I think, would be someone asked about the point features at the start. And I said at the end, I talk about how mental point features are. Point features being these small things I spoke about here. But when you're driving home, you are not picking up minute little bits of information. You're picking up the great big oak tree that you so love when the sun sets through it. There's a particular stand of trees that means going home for me as I drive back to Woodstock that I adore. And I always think about that's the visual feature that I'm navigating. There's the house, there's the, the door. There are huge things that we navigate by. But here's the thing. Those things are place dependent. That stand of trees only exists on that part of the A44. Okay? That door only exists here. I've never seen a door like this again okay, in this context. So shouldn't the machines, by use, just because we drive them, learn the big salient features that are in the world? And maybe those salient features are much, much, much more robust 
against lighting changes. Shall we have a look? So I came back from a conference and I went on a bit of a bender at the group. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm absolutely sick of imagining that there's an algorithm that you run on every image and then you start doing your processing. What we should do is say, where roughly is the image taken from? Then what processing should I do because the image is taken from that place? So because I'm going around the southeast corner of Doom, we call it our Begbrook, I know that the farmhouse is visible, but I don't want to write if C farmhouse then. Okay, I want the machines to learn that for free. And quite a brilliant student of mine, Colin McManus, has done this. And so what we do is we can look at this. It's learnt, this is day night, this is vision at night. It's learnt that this green square can be captured at night as well. And this is a nighttime view. And it's learnt that there's something about the structure captured by this horizontal red box that's also seeable at night after the rain, in sunny days and in the snow. We didn't teach it that, but it learned that. So these are these mid-level features that we're finding. And we're finding an extraordinary application for this kind of stuff. Now, the navigation that we get is not so good. It's not millimetres or centimetres anymore. It's of this kind of area. But hey, you might have another behaviour that stops you swinging across over the roads. And so we're very excited about this. So this is learning to see in a way that changes according to where you are. Well, I think you do that when you're walking through your home. OK, when you're going through your home, there will be things that you're seeing and you'll be navigating with it. There'll be things that you're looking for because you know they're there. You're much more cautious in a new place than a familiar place. Um, and here you go. Just I think this is absolutely astounding. This is us playing different scenes from the same place in different weather conditions. So snow against midnight rain. OK, when you see green, that's good. It means it's mapped the same thing. Um, and I think we'll go to some different, different movies as we go around. It's pretty... This is pretty, this is the latest stuff. This came out a couple of months ago. We we're very excited about this. I thought I would end the lecture with where we're going now is removing these dependencies, really trying to go out in all the weather, whatever the weather, really trying to go out every day, whatever's happening and dealing with that. So I think I'm going to end there. I was going to give a lecture about what happens now with this message. <laughs> Thank you very much.